ordinary uh, ordinary folk um, and often how that um, uh, how that was not represented or valued by the ruling classes of the time themes which I think are so very relevant uh, today. So the first song that I'm going to sing um, is called Green uh, Grow the Rashes or Green Grow the Rashes oh. um, and uh, whilst for me anyway this whilst Burns was obviously known uh, for his love uh, of women perhaps in the sense of uh, his uh, I think how to put this well yeah just he'd obviously been with a, a large number of women but for me this also shows that he had a deep respect um, for women and their knowledge and their power um, that um, often was overshadowed by perhaps uh, the men who would have been uh, those that were revered um, and often I suppose still are today so um, here we go then there's naught but care on every hand, and every hour that passes, oh, what signifies the life of man, and to earn for the lasses, oh, green grow the rashes, oh, green grow the rashes, oh, the sweetest hours that ever I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. The worldly race may riches chase, and riches still may fly them all. And though at last they catch them fast, their herds can ne'er enjoy them all. Green grow the rashes, oh, green grow the rashes, oh, the sweetest hours that ever I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. But give me a canny routine, my arms about my dearie, oh. Unworldly cares, unworldly men, may I gang tapsal teary, oh. Green crow the rushes, oh. Green crow the rushes, oh. The sweetest hours that ever I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. For you, say deuce, you sneer at this, you're knocked but senseless asses, oh, thou wisest man the world there saw, he dearly loot the lasses, oh. Green grow the rushes, oh, green grow the rushes, oh, the sweetest hours that ever I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. Of nature swears the lovely dears, her noblest work she classes, oh, her parentis hand she tried on man, and then she made the lasses, oh, green grow the rushes, oh, green grow the rushes, oh, the sweetest hours that ever I spent were spent among the lasses, oh, green grow the rushes, oh, green grow the rushes, oh, the sweetest hours that ever I spent were spent among the lasses, oh. Um, I can't see all of you anymore, my view's changed, but um, it was lovely to see a few new faces. We're obviously having a wee sing-song along. Um, I'm so, I, honestly, I'm so looking forward to when, when we can get together uh, and sing, sing again. Um, the next song I thought that I would sing um, is uh, still on the theme, I suppose, of women, um, 
but for me anyway it's actually my my favorite burn song a fond kiss and i think it um is a song about um real for me real love um how the how the experience and the joy of love um that it's that the only through experiencing the kind of loss and grief of love can you truly experience love's gift um now andrew hagan tells me that um nancy uh, who burns wrote a fond kiss for was a lover of burns she was a married woman um and it sounds like they had quite a fun and illustrious affair no doubt Ailey will tell us a bit more about that um, and her name was agnes um Maclehose. um so anyway so here's i suppose to agnes and uh, clearly burns great uh, love lost i suppose of her a fond kiss and then we severed a farewell alas forever deep in her drunk tears i'll pledge thee wearing sighs and groans i'll wage thee who shall say that fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him me lights me dark despair around benights me i'll ne'er blame my partial fancy nathan could resist my nancy but till I see her was to love her, love but her and love forever. Had we never loved so kindly, had we never loved say blindly never met or never parted we have never been broken hearted fare thee will thou first and fairest fare thee Indeedest, thine be no joy and treasured peace and joy, and love and pleasure. A fond kiss, and then we severed. tears i'll pledge thee warring sighs and groans i'll wage thee thank you um that song every time i sing it um not only like Burns obviously was just such an incredible lyricist, but I also think he um, 
he set his songs to the most incredible tunes. And I always think that song, for me, it certainly in my voice anyway, it totally spans that kind of break in your voice and your emotion. Um, so I just feel like not only are his words talking about um, uh, love and grief and that broken heartedness, but you actually hear it even in the singing of that song. It's a really difficult song to sing, but I love it. Um, the last song I'm going to sing then before uh, we hear from Ailey is um, A Man's A Man For All That. And it's uh, it's not actually a song, um, at, uh, Our Burn Suppers, that I normally sing. I think of this song as being sung by my husband. And so uh, yesterday and today, when I was kind of singing it again, uh, or, or kind of reading and listening to it again, it struck me um, just how relevant um, uh, Burns' um, thoughts and um, kind of views of the world and views of power and the misuse of power, um, just how relevant uh, they remain today. Um, so I think, I think there's a few uh, folk in power um, not just here, but uh, uh, globally across the Atlantic that still need to learn many of the lessons that this song speaks to. Uh, and I've now got the tune for Avon Kiss stuck in my head. <laughs> Oh, honestly, isn't it funny how a tune, I don't know if this happens to any other singers on here, when you've suddenly got... Yeah, here, thank you, Ian. that's all I needed, a wee did a wee did a wee did a Is there for her on his poverty that hangs his heat and a that the coward slave, we pass him by, we dared be poor, and for a that, for a that, and a that, our toils obscure, and a that, the rank is but the guinea stamp, the man's the goat, and for a that. But though on him the fair we dine, we're hot and grey and all that. He fools their silks and leaves their wine. A man's a man for all that. For all that and all that, but tinsel show and all that. The honest man, the worst he poor, is king of men for all that. Ye see yon barky, cad a lord, was the rats and stairs and a' that. Though honour to worship at his word, he's but a coof for all that. For all that and all that, his ribbon star and all that. A man of independent mind, he looks and laughs at all that. A prince can mark a belted knight, a marquis, duke and all that. But an honest man's a boonie's might, great faith he men for that. For all that and all that, their dignities and all that. The pith o' sins and pride o' worth are higher rank than others. Then let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that. That sense and worth, what the earth shall bear the grief and all that. 
for all that and all that it's coming yet for all that that man to man the world our shall brothers be for all that for all that and all that it's coming yet for all that that man to man the world our shall brothers be for all that well thank you everyone i hope that you unmute and applaud if you want to <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's what you all. Uh, we were all singing. Great! I knew you would be back in your rooms. I hope that's got you in the spirit for uh, Burns, and uh, I'm real. I hope you all are. I know you all are, and I'm really looking forward mm. to hearing Ailey speak. Okay, okay. and uh, Ellen, um, have a glance at the chat when you've got your breath back. <laughs> there's some nice comments there. Um, okay, so uh, we're handing over now to Ailey. Uh, Dr. Ailey Whiteford is studied English and Scottish literature at Glasgow University and she achieved a master's and then later went on to do a PhD. She's uh, researched at Guelph in Canada as well where she did a master's. She's worked for Oxfam and several other campaigns in the voluntary sector. Uh, the ones I've got down are Scottish Carers Alliance, Make Poverty History, the Scottish Fair Trade Forum global call to action against poverty and i'm sure there are several others uh, from 2010 to 2017 a lot of us know that she was of course the mp for bamf and buchan and she was smp spokesperson for women fishing uh, um, that isn't the same thing women comma fishing comma food and rural affairs and for international development uh, in 2019 she studied with us, well 2018, 2019 she studied with us in the University of Aberdeen at the Elphinstone Institute and achieved her MLIT in folklore and ethnology. So goodness me, who better than Ailey to speak to us this evening about Robert Burns. Okay, over to you Ailey. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ian, and for the invitation to, to speak tonight. As you said earlier, this is the time of year where it's customary to turn our attention to Robert Burns around the anniversary of his birth. But once again, for another year running, we are having to do it remotely, which I'm sure everyone will agree is a bit of a scunner. When Ian asked me if I would speak at this event, I was at pains to emphasise to him that I am not a Burns specialist by any stretch of the imagination, despite my background in Scottish literature. I'm just someone who finds it hard to say no emphatically enough, especially to the Aberdeen branch of the Saltire Society. So thank you very much for having me and for tuning in this evening. Ironically, I think it's evident that the pandemic has actually made the annual celebrations of Burns and all his works more inclusive and more global than ever before. I mean, this online forum does, I suppose, allow folk who might be housebound to take part and even folk who can't be bothered coming out on a dreary January night. Um, and also, as we're seeing tonight, it's possible to zoom in from all parts of the world. Uh, so a special welcome to the folk from North America and Ireland and England who are here tonight. It's, it's great that so many people have come from uh, Firth of Aberdeen, I think it's fair to say. However, if you're eating leftover microwaved haggis tonight in front of a computer screen, stuck at home with your drunken blellum or your sulky sullen dame, you might feel inclined to agree that the event has lost something. Anyway, these are strange days. Although I'm no Burns scholar, I'm not sure that matters too much because Burns is very much the people's poet. He's a national bard, so in that respect, he's too important to leave entirely to experts. Each of us owns a little piece of this heritage and all of us are entitled to an opinion. So although there are very many scholars who can talk about Burns's life and work with much greater authority than I can, what interests me more is what he means for us here and now. To be honest, I've come quite late to a full appreciation of the man and his poetry. He looms so large over Scottish life and letters that I feel he's sometimes overshadowed other distinctive and diverse voices. 
And the uncritical way in which he's often idolised creates, I think, an inflated image that distorts more measured assessments. But one of the pleasant things about discussing Burns out with the more adulatory context of a Burns supper is that we can be a, a bit more balanced in our assessments, candid about Burns's shortcomings and limitations as well as his considerable achievements. Personally, I've always felt somewhat ambivalent about both the bardolatry that surrounds Burns and the manifest contradictions in his life and work. But nevertheless, his talents and his enduring appeal just can't be denied and we can't escape his influence as we seek to negotiate our own relationships with our traditions and our cultural heritage. Finding ourselves marking Burns Night online for a second year running has made me think a bit differently about Burns. It brings home to me just how relentlessly sociable he was and how much of his whole oeuvre depends on social interaction, whether he's advocating a get together between juicy neighbours, getting road and foo with Kurt and Jean, playing at Kurt's at Poozie Nancy's, singing dirty songs with his pals at the Masonic Lodge or the Tarbolton Bachelors Club, fornicating with the lassies in the green growing rashes o, or even the genteel drawing rooms of the Edinburgh Newtown. Robert Burns comes across as someone who sought out company fairly voraciously and whose poems and songs are best enjoyed in communal settings. And it strikes me powerfully that so many of the poems and songs for which he's best remembered are songs of connection and separation, as we just heard from Elle, A fond kiss and then we sever. Our current circumstances, I think, encourage us to see these poems in a new light. And at a time when we've all been confronted with mortality, and I'm conscious that many of us will have lost loved ones in difficult circumstances over the last two years, what is it in Burns that we toast every year that remains immortal? He himself died at a painfully young age, just 37 years old, a man still in the prime of his youth. Yet some of his very best poetry grapples with the precariousness of life, how small we are in the big scheme of things, and how futile it is to think that we can control fate. Te Amus is one of Burns' most widely anthologised poems, and it captures memorably the fears of uncertain times and possible difficulties ahead. But Musi, thou art nail thy lane, and proven foresight may, may be vain, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glee, and leas nocht but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared to me, the present only toucheth thee, but och I backward cast my e on prospects dear, and forward, though I canna see, I guess and fear. The poem strikes an ominous note at the end, framing an existential predicament that none of us can avoid. Paradoxically, the fear of the ultimate separation, death, captured so expressively by Burns, might be seen as a phenomenon that actually connects us all at the most profound level. Burns was no stranger to hardship during his lifetime. Then as now, the pursuit of the muse was hardly lucrative. Farming never brought him an adequate livelihood, and even though he achieved considerable recognition as a poet and a fair degree of celebrity in his own times, his finances were never all that healthy. He struggled all the time, I think, to support his family. I'm reminded of the North East farmer who won the lottery, who, when he was asked what he planned to do with his winnings, replied, keep firm until the money runs out. We know that financial pressures plagued Burns, and I think we can see those insecurities reflected in his poems. But his continued efforts to write and publish also highlight, I think, a degree of determination and resilience in his character. He faced some fairly big obstacles in his personal and professional life, and it must have taken a bit of thrawn willpower not to jack it all in for a bit more stability. <coughs> I'm sure many of you will be aware that um, Burns had strong family connections to the North East. His, his father, William Burness, was born in Concordanshire of tenant farming stock before moving to Ayrshire, where he married a local lass called Agnes Brune, who gave birth to Robert, their first child, on the 25th of January, 1759. Ayrshire is, of course, quite right to claim Burns as one of their own, but greater scholars than me have pointed out traces of Northeast dialect evident in some of the language Burns uses, so I think we can say that his family ties to this area did at least have some influence on him. But Burns lived in very turbulent times. 
During his short lifetime, all of Europe was caught up in social and political upheaval, and Scotland was no exception. Burns wrote about it. While Europe's eye is fixed on mighty things, the fate of empires and the fall of kings, while Quax's state must each produce his plan, and even children lisp the rights of man. These words seem as relevant and prescient today as they ever did. But at the time Burns wrote them, revolutionary fervour was sweeping France and America. New, radical ideas, liberty, equality, fraternity, were inspiring a generation who would change the course of history in the late 18th century. And these ideas find voice again and again in the poems and songs of Burns, who was in this respect very much a man of his times, who clearly felt a strong affinity for these struggles for of Scotland and a connection to the people engaged in them. One of those revolutionaries who was to have a profound impact on Burns was Thomas Paine, whose political philosophy inspired the American Revolution and Declaration of Independence. In 1791, Paine published his famous treatise on the rights of man, a defence of the French Revolution, where he wrote, The patriots of France have discovered in good time that rank and dignity must take a new ground. It must now be the substantial rank of character instead of titles. If these words sound a little bit familiar to you, it's maybe because you heard them about five minutes ago. A prince can mack a belted knight, a marquis, duke, and all that. But an honest man's aboon his might, good faith he mona for that. For all that, for all that, their dignities and all that. The pith of sense and pride of worth are higher rank than all that. Burns published A Man's A Man for All That in 1795, just four years after Payne's treatise appeared. And to me, this is part of Burns's genius, that he could take a highfalutin, controversial, revolutionary idea and immortalise it in a song that people still sing more than two centuries later. It was great to hear Elle sing it um, just a few more moments ago. None of us who heard Sheena Wellington sing this song on the day the Scottish Parliament was reconvened in 1999 will ever forget either her performance or the sentiments it expressed. The rank is but the guinea stamp, the man's the gowd for all that. To the extent that we've internalised those sentiments in Scotland, the idea that a person's worth is not based on their wealth or status, but on their inherent human value, we owe in no small part to Robert Burns. But the Burns I like best is Burns the songmaker. He wrote lots of other political songs. Some of them look to history. For example, Scots with Hay with Wallace Bled commemorates the Scottish Wars of Independence. What a parcel of rogues in a nation laments the grubby deals that led to the Act of Union in 1707. But many others are more contemporary to his own times. The songs expressing Jacobite sympathies, for instance, and many, many satirical songs poking fun at the good and the great. I suspect today that satire is just dead um, and Burns would have to find another outlet, but that's maybe just my, just my view. In the years since his death, I don't think it would be too controversial to say that his legacy has been a very significant building block of a cohesive sense of Scottish identity, not just at home, but in diaspora communities around the world. I also think it's really important to emphasise that Burns was steeped in an oral tradition he inherited mostly from his mother. He was a song collector as much as a song maker. And many of his songs are based on traditional material reworked to a greater or lesser extent. Indeed, some of the songs often attributed to Burns are actually traditional songs that he heard and wrote down. A good example would be the haunting love song, Call the Yows to the Nows, which is often attributed to Burns. But Burns himself openly acknowledged that he'd learned the song from a Reverend George Clooney and had then added some stanzas to the song and mended others. But the song is also known to have been in the repertoire of a noted Ayrshire singer, a woman called Tibby Pagan, who lived a quote-unquote disreputable life, and she said that she'd learned some of it from someone else and made up bits of it herself. This suggests that Burns is more the conduit than the composer of the song, and many others that we now associate with him. There was probably a strong element of what we would nowadays call salvage ethnology in Burns' song collecting. Like an antiquarian, he was trying to preserve a cultural legacy of old songs that he feared would soon disappear if they were not recorded. But he was also adapting that traditional material he encountered, mostly in rural settings, for much wider audiences and for more urban and bourgeois settings. 
Many of the song lyrics collected and modified by Burns ended up in influential anthologies of Scots song, such as the Scots Musical Museum, published by James Johnson in 1797. Songs that might previously have been heard around the hearth or in the fields or in the pub now found their way into the refined drawing rooms of Edinburgh and onto the concert platforms of Europe. If you're interested in this, Professor Kirsten McHugh of Glasgow University has recently published a book about Burns' collaboration with the music publisher George Thompson, who commissioned the elite of European composers, figures including Haydn, Beethoven and Weber, no less, to set Scotch lyrics to music, many of them these traditional lyrics adapted by Burns. Between 1793 and 1818, Thompson published a select collection of original Scottish airs, which married Scottish folk songs with what we might call more classical arrangements, though I'm not always sure to the extent to which these kind of generic distinctions are helpful. Certainly, though, Burns helped to put traditional Scottish songs on a cosmopolitan European stage, forging connections with the artistic and musical scene of continental Europe um, in a way that reinforced a romantic image of Scotland that I, I don't think we've ever quite shaken off in spite of everything. I suspect these prestigious printed editions of sheet music also helped expose the source material to a much wider domestic audience too, even though Burns's version often bore little resemblance to the songs he'd collected by the time he'd finished with them. Those of us who've grown up with access to broadcast or recorded music maybe have to stretch our imaginations to fully appreciate a world in which all music was live music and most of it homemade. Technological advances really have afforded a seismic shift in musical culture. I think even in my own lifetime, I've witnessed a relative decline in informal communal live music making in domestic environments. Fewer parties end in raucous or maudlin singing at three in the morning than was the case maybe even 20 or 30 years ago. Or maybe I'm just getting old. Um, but Burns' songs have been a staple of informal Cayleys for generations. Now perhaps we're more inclined to put on a CD or stream some content, maybe from someone like Ellen who sang so beautifully. Um, Burns often made extensive revisions to his traditional material or set traditional lyrics to different tunes in ways that bore little resemblance to either the letter or the spirit of the original. A good example of this is probably a song we all know, the touching love song, John Anderson, My Joe, where an old woman reflects on the depths of love embodied in a lifelong loving partnership. John Anderson, my Joe, John, we clam the hill together, and mony a canty day, John, we've had way in another. New we mon totter doon, John, but hand in hand we'll go, and we'll sleep together at the fit, John Anderson, my Joe. The traditional song from which Burns derived this well-known, well-loved version is strikingly different. It was published after his death in the Merry Muses of Caledonia, along with what can only be described as dozens of other fairly rock and body songs. The transformation is very stark. Here's a wee flavour of the traditional version. By the way, my husband said I shouldn't share this with you. He said the respectable folk at the Saltire Society, they didn't want to hear about Burns the Bod. Well, I'm not so sure about that. It's a big part of who Burns was. Anyway, any of you who have a delicate constitution may want to just mute me now or cover your ears. But the original version went something like this. John Anderson, my friend John, when first you did begin, you had as good a tail tree as any other man. But now tis waxing old, John, and it waggles to and fro. It never stands its lane new, John Anderson, my Joe. Trust me, that is one of the more repeatable stanzas. But when we compare that to the version we all know, we can see how Burns' romanticising tendencies come to the fore. He's very much a romantic poet, possibly the finest. In fact, I'm hard pushed to think of any poet whose love songs have entered the collective consciousness so profoundly. My love is like a red, red rose that's newly sprung in June. My love is like a melody that's sweetly played in tune. Or from the same song, Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. And I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of time shall run. These are heady sentiments, and this is another song that has its roots in traditional material. And we should also probably acknowledge that in songs like this one, Burns talked a very good game he never managed to live up to. In reality, he treated some of the women in his life pretty appallingly. But no one can deny that it's intoxicating stuff. He wrote the lines I'm about to um, return to uh, 
for Agnes McElhose, who's already been mentioned this evening, um, the lovely Clorinda and uh, Nancy of his poems, from whom he was separated when her husband intervened in their affair and packed her off to the West Indies. This is perhaps his song of separation par excellence, uh, as we heard earlier. A fond kiss and then we sever. A farewell, alas, forever. Deep in hurt-drunk tears I'll pledge thee. War in sighs and groans I'll wage thee. Who shall say that fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him? Me, nay cheerful twinkle lights me. Dark despair around benights me. And he goes on later. Fear thee weal, thou first and fairest, fear thee weal, thou best and dearest. Thine be ilka joy and treasure, peace, enjoyment, love and pleasure. The anguish is all too keenly expressed. It reaches across the centuries to our own experiences of love and loss of human beings caught up in the tides of history. One of my favourite burn songs, and the one I'll leave you with, captures exactly the sense of the human condition, precarious yet precious, fraught yet joyous. These lines from Now Westland Winds sum up for me how Burns, like so many of us, yearns for a simple life, an uncomplicated love, in tune with the seasons and the land, yet he faces the maelstrom of war and the endless challenges of life, which he compares to a pastoral idyll to which brutality is integral. Thus every kind their pleasure find, the savage and the tender, some social join and leagues combine, some solitary wonder. Avant away the cruel sway, tyrannic man's dominion, the sportsman's joy, the murdering cry, the fluttery, gory pinion. Life's not simple or easy. Burns knows it and he names the existential conflicts at the heart of the human condition. We remember Robert Burns at this time of year for many reasons. He was a complex man of many contradictions, but more than 250 years after his birth, we pay tribute to him for the passion, dignity and sheer humanity he brought to the struggles of what was often a difficult and impoverished life. Burns dared to dream and imagine a better world. Then let, it pray, let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that, that sense and worth out of all the earth shall bear the grief for all that, for all that and all that, it's coming yet, for all that, that man to man the world ours shall brothers be, for all that. So a man separated from us by the centuries connects with us today, and helps us to connect to each other. I hope it won't be too long before once again we can toast him properly and in person again. Thank you very much. Do one mute and uh, give a round of applause to Ailey if you feel. Yeah, I muted everyone and probably Ailey too. So Ailey, if you'd unmute yourself. Um, do we have any questions um, or anything that people would like to suggest or, or ask Ailey's opinion on or, or comment? Um, I, I think I'll set the ball rolling. Um, <clears throat> I can think of many, many people and singers that I've met over the years that have been hugely influenced by Burns. But, um, Ailey, can you tell, give us any sort of insight into um, the people that Burns particularly admired, the, people, the writers that Burns admired or the poets that Burns admired? Um, we, you've mentioned, obviously, the political situation, but uh, what about the literary situation, the... Uh, clearly, he drew his songs from vernacular tradition, but were there other influences? I think there's sometimes a myth that Burns was a bit of an autodidact, a bit of a self-taught poet, and I don't think that's true at all. Um, he was the son of a farmer um, who had engaged a private tutor for his, for his children, uh, along with a neighbouring farmer. So Burns actually for somebody living in a very rural area, probably had a better education than many of his peer group. Um, so this idea that he wasn't, he was the, you know, the ploughman poet, I mean, obviously he was a, 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 a country rural man, but the idea that he didn't have 
um, quite a, quite a, a bourgeois education, I think, is misplaced. In terms of poets who influenced him, I know it's very widely quoted um, that he he was a great admirer of Robert Ferguson, who was a wee bit older than him, um, and had died even younger than Burns in dreadful circumstances in the Bedlam in in Edinburgh, uh, you know, as a pauper, and. Um, Burns described Ferguson as his elder brother in the muse. Uh, I think if you were being really, um, if you were being really honest, you would say that Ferguson was a, a better poet in in many respects, and and Burns openly acknowledged it. But Ferguson's um, corpus of work is much smaller, just because he died so so young. Um, but Burns was among the people who tried to um, raise subscriptions for a grave to Ferguson and. If anyone knows the Royal Mile in Edinburgh, there's actually a much more modern memorial to Ferguson uh, of a figure walking down the Royal Mile, um, which is a, a, a memorial to, to Ferguson, who really is, if, if you like Burns, you'll love Ferguson. Uh, well worth checking out. Thank you, Ailey. Do we have a, a question? If, if you can do it two ways, if you look in the uh, reactions, you can raise a hand and you can also wave a hand on screen by all means. Anybody want to ask a question? If I don't spot you, just unmute and speak. I'm looking around and can't see anybody yet, Ailey. Uh, we'll play for time though. <laughs> uh, we've got, uh, everyone is so dumbstruck, definitely. Ian, Ellen here. Sorry, I'm kind of staring at my computer screen blankly, forgetting how you put your wee wavy hand okay. up. So I'll just I'll just um, burst in. Um, this is maybe not so much a question about thinking of Burns of old, but um, I was really struck by what you said at the beginning about um, how uh, Burns can kind of overshadow um kind of talent and uh you know poets now that we place so much emphasis on burns that we we kind of forget to to showcase or look beyond him and i uh, uh i'm sure you have read i'm sure many others on here have read uh, is it sarah or sarah sheridan's uh book um where are the women um and it it's kind of struck me that well, I, I just loved reading that book and her kind of imagined uh, world where we um, we revere women um, in in the same way that men are. And I just I would love to hear from you. Then it's obvious from what you've said um, your interest and love of Burns, but who I, I I kind of I've kind of taken a wee idea from this that, that all my Burns suppers going forward, I'm going to. Uh, try and um, showcase the song or the poetry of someone new and I just would love to hear in, in that spirit of, of uh, um, Burns kind of talking about our experience and the experience of humanity any modern writers, poets, songwriters that stand out for you and that we should go and read or listen to I mean, I think I think it's important to say there were plenty of women writing in Burns's era, and you know they've been anthologised. Um, some of them by people like Catherine Kerrigan. Um, you know, you can go in there. Are probably the most noted songwriter, um, not maybe not exactly contemporaneous with Burns, but she wasn't far off. Is um, Carolina Oliphant, Lady Nairn, um, and you'll know the Rowan Tree. It's, you know, it's ubiquitous. Um, but she also wrote songs like the Laird of Cock Pen that are, you know, fantastic, funny, satirical um, songs. So I think I think that material's there. It just kind of needs to be dug out. And, you know, Sarah Sheridan's done us all a big, a big um, service, I think, by, by, by pointing that out. Um, and yeah, it, 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 maybe the other thing to say was that, that, um, the lovely Nancy, you know, was a was a, a poet too. I mean, that was why they connected. She wasn't just a, a patron. She was somebody who had literary aspirations herself. 
I think, I think, and I've written elsewhere about this, I think part of the problem is the way that um, canonisation happens, the way that um, the women get kind of written out of the history books, and I think that's an institutional issue within academia, frankly, that has only really been addressed in the last couple of decades. Um, and it's not, you know, I think, I think the, you know, even within Burns's uh, Burns's works, you know, the, the quality is quite uneven. You know, some of them are very, very good and some of them not so much. Um, the best ones are just superb, you know, world-class poetry. But um, the same goes for other people writing at the time. But, you know, it's not that there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of material there. And certainly a lot of the traditional material that Burns um, collected or knew had come from his mother. And I believe also his wife was, um, you know, was very much a singer who knew a lot of old songs. So, you know, he was surrounded by, by women who were sharing material with him. Um, I don't, I don't think it's um, by any means, you know, an empty well that you, you know, if you start to dive into it. Uh, we have two questions now. We'll take, um, we'll take one from. Kathy Ratcliffe first. Kathy, do you want to ask your question in person? If you do, just unmute. I can I can try and answer Kathy's uh, question, which is up, which I can uh, read out if Kathy's not coming in on it. Um, about uh, I suspect many women may share your initial hesitancy about admiring Burns wholeheartedly. Can you expand a bit more on your own initial hesitancy towards him? I think, I think as I, as I said, you know, part of part of it was just a bit contrariness, you know, because he's such a big figure, and a lot of people, when you say Scottish literature, they think it it begins and ends with Burns, and I was always very clear that that wasn't the case, and that there were other other voices in the room, um, but you know, it's a bit like having a big a big tree in your garden you know it's sometimes hard for other things to grow underneath that um and um hugh mcdermott for example was very uh, skeptical about about burns he felt that burns's influence on the cultural scene in scotland was not a positive one and he used to say um let's go back to dunbar let's celebrate the the earlier poets um of people like robert henderson and and william dunbar who are absolutely excellent and would thoroughly I would thoroughly recommend people explore those but um, and I think as well just as it, you know any any woman with a shred of consciousness born in the 20th century is going to question the the contradiction of Burns's um, sweet talk contrasted to the reality of his um, fa fairly shabby behavior frankly towards women who were absolutely vulnerable in days before they had the means to support themselves or um, access to birth control of any sort you know it 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 was a, a very it was a very serious thing um, for those women to have an, an unplanned pregnancy and Burns is thought to have fathered at least 13 children with any number of women um, and to have paid at least one um, one housemaid off uh, who was carrying his child and I'm not even sure he treated his wife terribly well in that he was gallivanting off around the country and and meeting the bonnie lassies some of some of it of course might have just been big talk you know but I still I still think that there's enough evidence of him getting into sufficient trouble and leaving um, young women in very serious trouble that you know I was always a wee bit skeptical because of that Okay, we've got a question now from Mary McCabe. Mary, do you want to say yeah. your question? Um, it's, it's not really so much a question, again, as a, as a remark, really. Um, regarding women writers in those days, um, well, obviously, we still, we're particularly now, in fact, we live in a celebrity culture. And when, once somebody is marked as a celebrity, everybody else has got a struggle to get out of the shadow. Now, Burns, um, you can be a really wonderful poet, but if you don't get published, then nobody's going to know about it beyond your immediate family. 
Burns largely got his stuff published because he was a member of the Freemasons. And the Masons, he joined the Masons in order to publish, to sort of publicise his poetry and so on, and they pushed it. Women, of course, were banned from the Masons. Um, women, um, although education was comparatively good in, in Scotland, and usually most women, most girls and boys would, would get to schools of some kind and, and probably learn to read at least. Girls were actually discouraged from writing. The, um, they thought that was a bit too, um, you know, they could maybe write to lovers or something like this. So although they were encouraged to read, they weren't encouraged much to write. And of course, there was also the burden of domesticity in a, a time when you had to, unless you had servants. And of course, Burns actually came from a class which did have some servants because he got one of them pregnant. Um, uh, you had to make your own bleach out of, out of urine and the urine that was best was men's urine on a Saturday night. Um, and, and so on. So that was the world that he was in. And for his time and class, he probably treated, as far as we know, treated them not too badly. As far as we know, he wasn't a wife batterer, although we probably wouldn't have got to know really if he was. He wrote some letters that were really horrible about his wife to his lovers. Um, but that, that was the world. You can't really go into the world in hindsight and compare them to, to nowadays. And there would be lots of women. Lady Nairn, you mentioned, but again, it's significant that she's an upper class woman. So she got her stuff published more easily because she had connections. So there would be a whole lot of um, women of Burns's class, um, which was kind of like middle class, really. He wasn't, wasn't really working class. He was a tenant farmer. Um, there would be women of his class who were writing when they got the time, but um, nobody there to publish them. Mary, that, that that is some really fascinating comments there. Do you want to come back to anything, Ailey? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you, you're right about the era. Middle class women um, having much more much more access to to literature and to education than um, than women who were having to, to work in, in very manual jobs and work very hard in them. Um, yeah, it, 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 you know, I mentioned earlier on, I mentioned to be pagan, Isabel Pagan. You know, she was basically quite itinerant as far as we know. And she was also disabled, which is presumably why she couldn't earn a living um, working in the fields or working in a bar or an inn or something. Um, and she, you know, was basically um, was basically busking um, and you know sometimes some people think that she is one of the sources for for Kodi Yaus but you know women like there aren't very many women remembered the way that Tibby Pagan actually has things attributed to her um, usually um, these women are, are the anonymous in, in traditional material Thank you, Ailey. We have um, a, a question now from Ian Brown. Just unmuting. Um, Ailey, thank you for that. Very, very interesting. The idea of connection and separation, and going back to McDermott and his remark, you know, not Burns, but Dunbar. Uh, when, when I was sort of studying early in the 60s and 70s, Burns was kind of not regarded. He was seen as very sentimental. Mm. Whereas now, 50 years later, he's taken it with enormous um, seriousness, possibly more than Mac McDermott. How, uh, what's changed? Why has that, in your view, come about? I think that's you... something I would I would have to give some thought to. I mean, I think I think fashions have changed. Um, you know, I think I think these things kind of come and go and you know what's fashionable in one century might not be so fashionable in another and you know I think working out why that might be and what's driving that um, you know might be another quite a, an extensive piece of excavation um, but it's certainly it's certainly true and you know you look at popular music in the 20th century so much of it is very sentimental and very romantic in, in um, quite a simplistic way um, you know turn on the radio you've got a whole host of three minute songs all about all about love um, you know so so I think 
I think it, we maybe are just in a more sentimental age than, you know, mid 20th, uh, early 20th century, where um, a lot of change had had um, come about very quickly, and um, people had also been brutalised by by the First World War. There's no two doubts about it. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't want to offer too analytical uh, a response to that without thinking quite a lot more about it. Mm. Thank you. Really. Ian, did you want to come back or is that, are you OK? Well, I just wondered if it was songs or something to do with the way that people like uh, Shina Wellington have treated him. So, it's, so the, the actual performances that have gone on mm. in the time, whereas in the, the 70s, he was kind of rather sentimentally presented, whereas there's a more robust approach now. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I think as well, you know, Burns has come out of the Masonic Halls quite a bit, you know, and certainly yeah. in my childhood, a lot of Burns suppers were all male affairs and they were pretty yeah. hardcore drinking sessions. And nowadays, I don't think there's so much of that. I mean, I think that there's still that element to it, but it's now, um, it's now broadened out, I think, into a, a wider society. And I think also, you know, what I was saying about how we listen to music, how we um, hear music has changed a lot. You know, we're just as likely to, you know, hear somebody like Elle singing a song beautifully on the radio as we are to hear um, somebody in the pub singing a dirty song um, with his mates. You know that the, the way we the way we listen to music and the way we hear these songs, the context of that has changed very radically. Okay, very well, helpful. Thank you. Yes, plenty of food for thought, and thank you, Ian, for that question. Um, we're going to wind up now. I think, Ailey. I don't think anybody else is pressing for a question. So, oh, Richard has suddenly raised a hand. Richard Bennett, go on then, Richard. Fire well, away. Hi, Ellie. Thanks very much indeed. That was wonderful. Um, yeah, a, a lot of what I was thinking about and thinking of asking questions that have already been spoken about. Um, back to Sheena Wellington and the opening of the Parliament. The, a man's a man for all that was the, the, probably the most emotional moment of the whole, of the whole occasion. Now, I think that Donald Dewar was there at that time, of course, but I made some sort of proposal that a man's a man for that should be Scotland's national anthem. Then, of course, he died the next year, and that whole idea was lost. Do you think, given the sort of universal universality of the thought behind a man's a man for other, that it would make a good Scottish national anthem? Is it worth starting a campaign for that? Um, I mean, I would like it a lot more than the one we currently have. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I think it's it would absolutely be up there as a contender. You know, I think the time to have that debate is is not not yet. Um, I know somebody <laughs> once suggested to me that the 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 real contender in all this is the Bay City Roller Shang Alang, and I, I find myself having a lot of sympathy with that view. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thank you, Richard. Uh, um, a very interesting question there. Um, I know there's been a fair bit of debate about that, and of course, Hamish's wonderful song, mm. Rock the Winds. Okay, well, now, um, we are not just going to come to a full stop. We're going to have another song from Ellen in a minute, um, a, a farewell song. <clears throat> before we finish, I'd like to tell you that uh, we have a meeting in uh, February, and our meeting is going to be talking about um, Aberdeen's granite industry and uh, all things connected with that. Uh, and it's being given by Jim Fiddis, who has written extensively about the industry. Um, I'm sure many of you will find that of interest. It's the 24th of February. Uh, I'll post maybe at another time our future programme. Um, but don't forget to look up the Assault Our Society. It really is something worth supporting and worth um, yeah, backing and, uh, and attending and going to meetings, whether you're in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen or wherever. 
or further afield. And thank you all those people from further afield who have joined us tonight. You have been excellent and uh, really appreciate your presence. And I'd like to say also a final thank you to Ailey, Ailey Whiteford, who has been such given us such an erudite and interesting talk about Robbie Burns, despite her disclaimer at the beginning not to be a scholar of Burns. <laughs> she did pretty well. OK, can we just give Ailey a round of applause, unmute and clap, Ailey. OK, so I'm going to mute everyone. Ellen, you might need to unmute yourself. And uh, and then um, it's over to you. So unmute Ellen, and you're away with. Um, so a song of that needs no introduction. Uh, Old Lang Syne, and I really hope that in your own wee offices or front rooms, wherever you are, we have a good sing along uh, to this yeah. one. And I hope at some point we're. we're and able this to... is the original tune that Robbie Burns had for the song. Um, it, a year or two later, the other tune was introduced. But it wasn't his tune. Okay, this is Robbie's tune. Should all the quintons be forgot and never brought to mind? Should all the quintons be forgot for all the lang syne, for all the lang syne, my jo, for all the lang syne, will tak a cup of kindness yet for all the lang syne, and surely you hear your pint stoop. And surely I'll be mine, and will take a cup of kindness yet for all the lang syne, for all the lang syne, my jo, for all the lang syne, oh, I'll take a cup. O oh, kindness yet for all the lang syne. We twa he run up to the breeze and to the gowans fine. But we've wandered money's a weary fit for all the lang syne. For all the lang syne, my jo, for all the lang syne, oh, I'll take a cup of oh, kindness yet for all the lang syne. Oh, we twa he paddled in the barn from morning sun till dawn, but the seas that twin us braid he roared for all the lang syne, for all the lang syne, my jo, for all the lang syne, oh, well, take a cup of kindness yet for all the lang syne. And there's a hand, my trusty friend, and gives a hand o' oh, thine, and will tag a recht good will he walk for all the lang syne, for all the lang syne, my jo, for all the lang syne, oh, well, Take a cup of oh, kindness yet for all the lang syne. Thank you so much, everyone. This has just been such an enjoyable night. And Ailey, I so enjoyed, so enjoyed your lecture. And I've Thank you very lot. much indeed, Ellen. And I know everyone's enjoyed your singing. Okay, everyone. Well, we'll uh, we'll uh, 
gradually disappear and play that game of last person standing. Um, uh, if you want to speak or say hello to somebody, do so now um, uh, because I will be closing the meeting in uh, 74 seconds. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Sorry, 70 seconds. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank Again, you. Bye. 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 Bye, David. Bye. <coughs> bye, bye. Hello, Laura. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Hello, David. <laughs> bye, David. Bye. Bye for now. Bye, Ian. Bye Thanks, Ian. Ian. You're very welcome. Well, another good lecture. Thank you, Ian. Well, thank you to our speaker and our singer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, we're we're down to penny numbers now, which is good. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Apparently, these thank expressions you. like penny numbers are disappearing, and people don't know what they mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Asking a group of youngsters uh, from, I think, from uh, inner London if they knew what's going to spend a penny was about, and they had no idea. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. I think it was a lovely evening, Anne, wasn't it? And, it was great. And, yeah, Charles, yeah. did you enjoy it? I'd certainly 